Pennsylvania became the first state to hold a ratifying convention to debate the Constitution, thanks to some less than legitimate political maneuvering and just a touch of assault and kidnapping. But why were political tensions so high that they could get to that point? After this video, I suggest you check out the channel History De Facto. They have a ton of great videos on Eastern European and Middle Eastern history. I've linked them below and at the end of this video. When Pennsylvania declared independence, the state was swept up by radical revolutionary fervor. They drafted a state constitution that was so weird and controversial that it became the center of political debate in Pennsylvania for the next decade. That's right. During the 1780s, while the whole country was talking about replacing the strange and dysfunctional federal constitution, Pennsylvania was having an identical debate at the state level. That's just how federalism be sometimes. So what was in Pennsylvania's 1776 constitution that made it so weird? At a glance, the legislature was unicameral, so no senate, and the executive branch was a council of 12 that would be led by a president. But what really set PA apart is that they allowed any taxpaying man to vote. Now, from the 21st century, you might think that restricting voting to just men isn't very radical. But remember that back then, all the other states restricted voting to men with a certain amount of property, effectively restricting voting to large male landowners. PA left this part out, and everyone else thought they were really strange for it. The Constitutionalist Party formed around defending their science experiment of a government from detractors. Their main body of support was from Western settlers, who generally had small subsistence farms and local knit communities. Thanks to the PA Constitution, they were represented in government, even if they only had small amounts of land. This group also tended to be Scotch-Irish colonists, and their rough frontier lifestyle gave them a reputation for being uncivilized. Everyone poked fun at them for their funny accents when saying stuff like address the speaker in the assembly. And of course, as frontier Gaelic folk, they were distrustful of government overreach. And of course, the English. Speaking of, the densely populated southeast around Philadelphia was settled by all sorts of English Protestants, and even a fair amount of Jews. But the group I want to focus on here are the Quakers. We'll get back to them in a minute. This region was more moderate on their views on democracy. So they were proponents of the Republican Party, which advocated for the reworking of the 76 Constitution to be less radically democratic. The area between these two factions was German country. As much as a third of Pennsylvania's population at Independence was of German ancestry, and they served as swing voters in elections. They weren't organized into a uniform political bloc, so Eastern Germans voted Republican and Western Germans voted Constitutionalist. By the way, when I'm talking about demographics here, it's worth keeping in mind that I'm generalizing. It's not like you cross a line and suddenly you're in or out of German country. The Constitutionalist Party ruled the state throughout most of the revolution. As radical revolutionaries, they were suspicious and sometimes paranoid about Tories and Tory sympathizers. As with the other former colonies, loyalists were frequently expelled from the state and their property was seized by the government. And with most revolutions, some of these charges were legitimate and others were clearly targeted smear campaigns to discredit political rivals, in this case, the Republicans. The Constitutionalists passed several measures that were ostensibly to root out loyalists, known as the Test Oaths. To vote in elections, Freeman had to swear an oath to the state of Pennsylvania and to the 76 Constitution. The catch here is that Quakers are pacifists, the religion forbids its followers from swearing oaths and taking sides in conflicts. The Constitutionalists had effectively banned a large demographics of Republicans from voting. The test oaths also hurt Republicans in other ways. Their whole party platform was dedicated to reworking or replacing the 76 Constitution, but if they wanted to run for office, they had to swear an oath that they would uphold and defend it. Gradually, as the revolution drew to a close and radical feelings faded, the Constitutionalists began to lose ground in the assembly, and the test oaths were abolished in 1787. Now, the Republicans could turn the tables and begin suppressing the Constitutionalists. Let's revisit that earlier video I made about how Pennsylvania called their ratifying convention. Nationally, the Republicans were Federalists, and they wanted to give the central government more authority. They wanted to scrap the 76 Constitution and the Articles of Confederation. So when the Constitutionalists tried to pull a fast one and delay the calling of a convention, the Republicans responded by sending the sergeant-at-arms to kidnap two Constitutionalists to force a quorum. By the way, yes, the Pennsylvania Constitutionalist Party supported the state constitution, 
but oppose the federal constitution. So just remember in this video, when I say constitutionalist, I mean people that were critical of the proposed United States Constitution. Okay, now you're all caught up with the political context leading up to the convention. In October, hundreds of copies of the Constitution on the way to Western towns simply vanished. It looked like the Republicans wanted to keep the Constitution away from Westerners so that they'd have to rely on opinion pieces published in heavily Federalist newspapers. William Finley and some other constitutionalists met in Philadelphia, where they attempted to coordinate their objections to the Constitution. They were briefly joined by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, who probably gave them some of his criticisms to use as well. That night, a dozen men showed up outside the building that they were staying in, and shouted that the damned rascals ought to be hanged. They threw some heavy stones and then fled. Not only were no arrests made, not a single newspaper in Philadelphia published the event. For the Constitutionalists, Philadelphia was hostile territory. Enough delegates arrived on the 21st for the convention to begin. They elected Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, a German pastor and the current speaker of the Pennsylvania Assembly, as the presiding officer. Muhlenberg was a Federalist and a Republican, but he was generally respected by everyone, or at least they respected the gigantic portion of Germans that he represented. They also allowed the doors of the assembly room to remain open to the public, unlike the federal convention. There, delegates could debate in secret and change their minds without fear of offending the public. But here, a crowd of extremely Federalist Philadelphians would be looking over the delegates' shoulders at all times. When they were setting up more debate rules and other administrative stuff, Dr. Benjamin Rush suggested that they open the debates each day with a prayer. Rush was an oddball, he was one of the most famous physicians in America, and fun fact, a very large proponent of bloodletting even after most people stopped practicing it. Anyway, most people respected his intelligence, but this was not one of those times. After he proposed a prayer, they looked at him like he had three heads. Pennsylvania was one of the most religiously diverse of all of the states, and they pointed out that they had never done prayers before these kinds of meetings ever before. Dr. Rush huffed and suggested that maybe it's no wonder that Pennsylvania was so divided. Kids these days just didn't pray like they used to. A constitutionalist named John Smiley dismissed Dr. Rush of spouting absurd superstitions and the matter was dropped. Robert Whitehill, another constitutionalist, suggested allowing the delegates to issue a statement in the official vote tally as to why they voted yes or no. This was voted down 44 to 22. Letting the delegates talk about why they rejected the constitution would make criticisms in the other states look more legitimate, so they couldn't let them get out. So this early on, the Republicans immediately were aware that they had a commanding majority of the convention. So why debate it at all? Why not force it through and be number one to ratify? Well, ever since the debacle that Republicans had caused calling the convention, they had been accused of steamrolling the opposition and not properly representing the people. So from a PR standpoint, they had to at least appear to give everyone a chance to voice their concerns. The debates began on November 27th, where it was suggested that they debate article by article starting with Article 1. But the opposition was hung up on the preamble. We the people of the United States seemed like it was trying to cut the states out of the government and give power directly to the people. Also, the preamble had no assertions that all men were created equal, like Pennsylvania's constitution had. After two days of debate on the preamble and a bit of Article 1, a delegate suggested maybe moving on to Article 2. Smiley objected, saying that they still hadn't debated the first words of the Constitution enough. The next day, the opposition switched tactics. Instead of going after the Constitution article by article, they began arguing against the whole document. This started with, you guessed it, pointing out that the Constitution lacked a Bill of Rights. James Wilson gave a speech that echoed his State House Yard address from October. Since Congress's powers were specifically enumerated, they were already blocked from infringing on individual citizens' rights. Adding a Bill of Rights saying what the government could not do would imply that everything left unsaid would be fair game. The opposition were ready for Wilson's logic. Smiley and Whitehill pointed out that the Constitution did explicitly prohibit stuff that Congress couldn't do. Several times. Also, Congress's powers were not as airtight as Wilson had claimed. The Necessary and Proper Clause literally gave Congress free reign to do anything necessary and proper to carry out its duties, not very specifically enumerated. Wilson also claimed that bills of rights were just not necessary, since not every state had one. 
Was New York or South Carolina or Virginia less free since they didn't have one? Wait, Virginia? Virginia had a very famous Bill of Rights, written by George Mason. Smiley pointed this out, but Wilson was like, nah -uh. Smiley later produced a copy of it as proof. It must have been embarrassing to watch. Wilson was a brilliant lawyer and Enlightenment philosopher, and he was getting schooled by this hick from Westmoreland County. Besides the lack of a Bill of Rights, the opposition accused Federalists of wanting to consolidate the states into a single government. Wilson again spoke in the Constitution's defense, and this time he was more successful. One of the fundamental assumptions of political theory in the late 1800s was that there could only be one fountain of political authority. Anything else would lead to imperia in imperio, meaning governments within a government. Conflicting authority would inevitably lead to conflict and civil war. This was exactly the form of government that they had now. The political authority of the states was the people, but the authority of the confederation was the states. The people under this new government would give some authority to the states and some to the federal government. This speech got to the core of just how revolutionary the US Constitution was. It was basically a framework on how American federalism would function. Like his State House Yard speech, it was published all over, and federalists across the country started adopting his talking points. On the 8th, Findlay gave a speech on the necessity of trial by jury in a free society, which the Constitution did not provide for in civil cases. He cited a historical example. Sweden had abolished trial by jury, and a tyrannical aristocracy dominated the court system. Wilson and Thomas McCain jumped up in anger. What was he talking about? They had never heard of Sweden having trial by jury in any form. McCain claimed, as Pennsylvania's chief justice, that no legal system other than the ones based on English common law had trial by jury. Finley promised them he'd find a source, but McCain was getting sick of debating. He knew that Federalists had a majority, and they had addressed all the opposition's concerns. Why couldn't they just ratify it already? Smiley accused McCain of being a snob, and the convention devolved into chaos. The delegates yelled at each other, and the audience in the gallery were causing a ruckus in the back of the room. Muhlenberg calmed everyone down, and the convention adjourned for the weekend. The following Monday, Findlay came in with his evidence. He read a passage from a prominent history book that confirmed that Sweden did take away trial by jury, and according to its author, it did have a negative effect on poorer Swedes. This was super embarrassing again. McCain and Wilson, two highly educated Philadelphia men, had been taken to school by this country bumpkin. McCain made no reference to Findlay's evidence, but Wilson couldn't let it slide. He said that he couldn't remember everything that he ever read, and then quoted a law professor saying, Young man, I have forgotten more law than you have ever learned. The convention was falling apart. The opposition began claiming that due to Republican voter suppression, constitutionalists in the West had not been able to elect delegates that accurately represented the opinions of Pennsylvania. Findlay claimed that only one-sixth of eligible voters had participated in the elections, and he proposed that the vote be put off until Pennsylvania could call another, more accurate election. Alarmingly, he suggested that if a vote was taken, it would not be legitimate in the eyes of the people. A Federalist delegate called him out. Voter turnout had been low everywhere, even Philadelphia. When Findlay's beloved 76th Constitution had been ratified, only 6,000 people total had voted. Whitehill backed up Findlay. He proposed 15 amendments to the Constitution that would act as a sort of Bill of Rights, but also restructure the Constitution to maintain the separation of powers and states' rights. His amendments included ones that had been proposed before, in Mason's objections and Lee's amendments, like limiting standing armies, and of course, trial by jury in civil cases. Also in his Bill of Rights was the right to bear arms for self-defense and hunting game. Structurally, he wanted the vice president to have nothing to do with the Senate, an executive council rather than a single president, a larger house of representatives, and make the state constitutions override federal treaties with other nations. Wilson and the Federalists saw amendments as the quickest way to prevent the Constitution from being ratified. Plus, he knew that the Federalists had a pretty substantial majority, so they could just force the Constitution through. On December 12th, the delegates voted on ratification. Pennsylvania ratified the Constitution by a vote of 46 to 23. Whitehill, in a last-ditch effort to get his amendments out there, tried to include them in the convention's journal, which he knew would be published. Of course, the Federalists voted this down. The crowd in the gallery cheered after the vote. Outside, thousands of Philadelphians gathered and cannons were fired in celebration. But this was not the huge victory that Federalists had hoped for. 
The opposition drafted another scathing address containing how they were again abused by the Federalist majority. They also included White Hill's proposed amendments. Constitutionalists began signing petitions asking the state legislature to nullify Pennsylvania's ratification. In the town of Carlisle, things turned violent when people celebrating ratification were broken up by an angry mob. Still, through their underhanded techniques, their heated debates, and their early convention, the first state to ratify the Constitution became… Delaware. Wait, Delaware? Delaware had ratified the Constitution just a few days earlier, on the 7th. Their convention only lasted five days, and they had ratified it unanimously. No pesky opposition there. If anything, the Pennsylvania Convention had shown that the critics of the Constitution were more influential than the Federalists had initially let on. More than that was how reasonable a lot of their arguments came across to the average voter. Not many people in the convention were arguing to throw out the Constitution and go back to the Articles. They saw flaws that resonated with a lot of people in all the states. Pennsylvania had ratified, but the debate over amendments had not been settled. 